Hello and welcome to topic six, lecture one. In this topic, we're gonna to be actually starting our journey of looking at specific public policies. And the first um, pol policies we're gonna take a look at deal with reproduction. And this lecture is dedicated to looking at contraceptive policy. This chapter examines the public debates and policies associated with reproduction. And it's divided into two sections. Um, one deals with contraception, which is the attempt to prevent a person from getting pregnant. Um, examples of contraceptives are condoms, uh, IUDs, diaphragms, um, hormonal pills. All of those fall under and are examples of contraceptives. And the other half of the chapter looks at not preventing pregnancy, but terminating a pregnancy once someone is pregnant. And that is, as we know, referred to as abortion. Um, and there's been a lot of public debate and continues to be a lot of public debate around not so much contraceptives, but around abortion, okay? Um, and so we're gonna look at how these debates have changed over time and how policy has changed over time. The first lecture will be dedicated to looking at contraception policy and the second lecture will take a look at abortion policy. So let's get started. Today we take, take it for granted for the most part that um, we have a lot of control and choice over whether or not we want to reproduce. Um, we engage in planned planning our pregnancies, right? Um, for the most part, uh, voluntary motherhood or voluntary parenthood. You choose to become a parent because you have access um, to contraceptives and today they're due to public policy, they're actually more accessible and more affordable than they've, they've been in, in the past. Um, and so, you know, today it's really easy to manage reproduction um, if, if we choose to do that because we have access to both contraceptives and abortion. Um, it's also um, th that we live in a time where having sex is um, delinked from reproduction. And so we can have sex for a variety of reasons. We might want to um, engage in sexual activities because it makes us feel closer to another individual. We might do it because it's just um, pleasurable and we want to um, experience that pleasure. Uh, but we can engage in sexual activities without the fear or the concern of getting pregnant, um, you know, hanging over our heads due to the fact that we have access to contraceptives and abortion. Um, voluntary motherhood is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, for most of history, uh, women have had little reliable control over their reproduction. Um, not that, I mean, contraceptive methods have been around for thousands of years, um, but they were, you know, maybe not as reliable as something like a hormonal pill is. Um, and so for most of history that um, sex was linked with reproduction and choosing whether or not to become pregnant was um, a difficult thing to do. Getting to the place of voluntary parenthood um, did not magically happen. Uh, it was a result of changing attitudes about contraceptives and abortion and changing public policy. And so your textbook identifies three phases of policy that reflect how contraception is defined by policy or defined by society and then how that definition is reflected in public policy or law. Um, the first phase that we'll be taking a look at is that contraceptives um, are treated as obscene or illicit material and therefore need to be um, either highly regulated or prohibited. The second policy phase we're gonna take a look at is a shift of thinking in terms of contraceptives from being obscene material to um, something that we need to prevent um, disease and to prevent harm. And then the third phase that, um, that we'll be looking at is that contraceptives are thought of as a tool for planning your family and also uh, a tool that liberates people, that you have a personal choice and personal freedom 
to determine when and um, you, when and if you want to get pregnant. So let's take a look at these three different uh, phases. There's a lot more detail in the textbook, so you should regard this lecture as an overview of these policies. Now, prior to the 19th century, contraception was and con contraceptives were regarded as a private matter. Um, women used contraceptives. Men used contraceptives. It just was something that was seen as a, um, a private sphere uh, matter. Uh, and, and keep in mind that there are these the, those uh, separate spheres, right? That there are these spheres that are sort of um, the, 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 the sphere for women and the, and the sphere for men. And oftentimes the sphere for women were private places in the home, not engaging in public activities such as voting or getting involved in politics or business. And the public sphere, uh, which was seen as a sphere for men, um, and that was a place that was more likely to be regulated by law because it was in the, the public realm. And so contraceptives were used, um, but it was a private uh, matter between women and uh, midwives who were women. Um, it wasn't, and, and you're gonna see that this is the same case when it comes to abortion policy, that women have um, for a long time sought to terminate their pregnancies, uh, but they did it in a private matter with themselves and, 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 their, and a, a female midwife. So um, contraceptives were practiced, but it was not subject to sort of a public debate or um, public policy. Um, that changes as we move into the uh, early part of the 19th century or the 1800s, uh, the early to the mid part of the 1800s. And it's that point where contraceptives enter the public debate. Um, and it enters into the public debate um, in two ways. Uh, one way is concerns about the growing number of people that are in the United States, and not just in the United States, but beyond the United States as well. And so um, contraceptives became a public issue um, because people wanted to control population growth. And let's keep it real, oftentimes the controlling of that population growth was controlling the population of immigrants who were coming into the United States in the mid part of the 19th century. It also, uh, contraceptives also enter the public debate um, because of a mid 19th century concern about um, uh, morality and um, that, that uh, that there was this, you know, growing sense that um, sex was proliferating and it wasn't staying in the private home, but it was entering into the streets, particularly in urban areas with prostitution trades. Um, and there was this whole sense that if we didn't do something about it, um, then uh, uh, those who are socially pure, particularly women in upper classes, would be sort of harmed by this moral degeneration. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so there was some concern there uh, to enter um, sexuality and, 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 and sexual intercourse and sexual exchange into the, the public realm, uh, that it was no longer something that could be kept in the private realm. These concerns about um, sex and moral degeneration were embodied by this individual whose name is Anthony Comstock and is the force behind the first um, laws that prohibit or criminalize the uh, use and distribution of, of, of contraceptives. And so, you know, the driving force behind the Comstock Act, and put it up there, it's an act that defines contraceptives as obscene and illicit materials. And as such, that it, this law makes it a federal offense to disseminate birth control through the mail or to transport birth control between state lines, okay? 
So um, if, if anyone was caught, you know, mail ordering contraceptives, which would happen, or even getting information about contraceptives through the mail, or as contraceptives are made, and if they're transported between state lines, um, that was a federal offense, and you could be um, a prosecuted for that. You might be sort of thinking, well, wait a second, like, how is contraceptives, how are those uh, regarded as obscene and illicit materials. Well, to understand that, you kind of get to get into the mind of Anthony Comstock. Um, he is the driving force uh, be behind these anti-birth um, control status uh, uh, laws. Uh, he was a New Yorker. Um, he was born in Connecticut, um, and he was a devout Christian, but he was also a salesman. And so that when he, he moved to New York City, and as a salesman, he saw what he thought was this appalling activities on the city streets of, of, of New York. Um, to him, the town seemed to be like teeming with prostitutes and pornography. Um, and uh, that, that just made him want to go on this um, rampage to pass laws that are sort of deal with the chastity laws. And he linked contraceptives to this, um, this, uh, this uh, rampant sexuality that was going on in the streets. It was sort of like, hey, if people can get contraceptives, they're going to use those contraceptives and they're going to be able to have sex without consequences. And also just reading and about and seeing materials about contraceptive, it like arouses sexual desires in you. And so it makes you want to have sex. Okay. Um, and he really thought that you know, we needed to have these laws in the book in order to keep our our women in particular uh, pure um, because we really didn't want them to be having access to these contraceptives because it might lead them into being these, you know, sexual animals. Um, and so this this was federal law, it was first federal law that was passed that makes it a crime to um, disseminate and uh, transport birth control. Um, and it doesn't stop there. So uh, that federal law just applies to um, the jurisdiction of the federal government, the Postal Service and Interstate Commerce. Um, but it doesn't really uh, uh, impact what goes on in the state. So uh, over uh, 34 state, or I'm sorry, 24 states, they passed a state version of the, the federal law, and they're known as the Little Comstock Acts. And so these acts were in place to basically uh, make it a crime to either give people information about um, contraceptives, to disseminate contraceptives, and in the, in the most extreme cases, uh, as we're gonna see in the Connecticut law, that it was even a crime to use contraceptives in, in your bedroom. Well, these federal and state laws are challenged, and they're challenged by a person whose name you might be familiar with. Her name is Margaret Sanger. Um, Margaret Sanger is an American birth control ag advocate, um, a sex educator, a nurse, and is considered to be the founder of what we have today, which is um, Planned Parenthood. And um, she started her work uh, early on at the late part of the 18th, 19th century and into the early parts of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, she, uh, she uh, really saw firsthand the impact of not having control over your, uh, uh, over your reproductive capacity. Um, because she was a birth control advocate, she got a lot of letters from women who were um, not able to control their their reproduction. And she got letters from uh, young women who were in their early 20s who would write her and say, look, I have three babies already. I have one on the way and I am so stressed out. I am to so tired and I can't feel like I can even be a good parent to the kids I have because I'm just so stressed out and tired all the time. Uh, and so Margaret Sanger, um, you know, was uh, from very early on a birth control advocate. And so she um, challenged these Comstack acts. Um, and uh, initially she opened her, the first birth control clinic in the United States in 1916 in order to challenge these laws. She was charged, tried, and found guilty. And she realized that sort of arguing um, to overturn the 
uh, these Comstack decks on the grounds that women need to have control over their reproduction, that that wasn't going to be very successful. She realized that she needed to take a different approach to challenge these um, federal and state laws. Um, and the approach that she took is what's known as the medical seeking a medical loophole to these laws. Um, she said that uh, to change these laws, that we, sh we can't focus, if we want to be successful, we can't focus on that freedom and rights of women because that's going to fall on deaf ears. But if we want to successfully challenge these laws, we have to focus on the right of male doctors to treat patients and that laws can't tell male doctors what they can do and, and, uh, to address the health and well-being of their female clients. And that med finding a medical loophole and focusing on the rights of male doctors rather than the rights of women was a successful approach. So I, as I stated that th this approach was successful and it, um, it was successful because it appealed to two powerful interests in society. And keep in mind that if you want to get policy done, you have to create a network of political actors, people who have a stake in the game, people who want to um, change a policy because they feel like it relates to their interests. That's what's known as a policy community. Um, and Margaret Sanger was able to tap into two of those um, uh, powerful interests that had sway in um, in the in Congress and also at the state level. Um, one were doctors, uh, and as we're going to see with abortion, uh, we see it with contraceptives as well. That we see a rising class of the professionalization of medical doctors at the start of the 20th century. Um, and so, as I said on the last slide, that she appealed to doctors' rights to treat their patients. However, there was also a growing anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States at the turn of the century as well. And so she tapped into um, uh, uh, appealing to, hey, we can control the population of the undesirables. And how do we do that? We do that through birth control. OK, um, Margaret Sanger, you know, has a you know, kind of like all of the people we you know, like Susan B. Anthony, um, not supporting the 15th Amendment. Right. Um, you know, there's you get involved in with strange bedfellows when you want to achieve per policy goals. And Margaret Sanger definitely did that. Uh, she appealed to the anti-immigrant sentiment in order to further her goal at legalizing birth control. And so there were several legal um, uh, uh, challenges to the Comstock Act um, that greatly uh, weakened its impact. Uh, one in 1918 that says that women can use birth control for therapeutic reasons, so like heavy periods or uh, cramping and those sorts of things. And so that made it easier for doctors to be able to use their best judgment about what is considered therapeutic. Um, and in 1936, doctors can use mail to distribute birth control for uh, for medical reasons uh, to their how they best saw fit to distribute those and so those two successes in the courts uh greatly weakened the impact of the comstock act so while the comstock act was weakened um in many states birth control was still criminalized and it was particularly in the New England area, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, that uh, the people who lived in those states experienced the most restrictive laws in the country. Uh, in Massachusetts, anyone disseminating contraceptives or even information about contraceptives faced stiff fines and imprisonment. Um, and Connecticut was had one of the most restrictive laws on the book um, that where that even the act of using birth control was prohibited by the law, the law, okay? And that married couples could be arrested for using birth control in the privacy of their own bedroom. We look back at those laws, but those laws stayed on the books until the 1960s, the mid 1960s, okay? Um, and so while they were not enforced, uh, it, they could have been enforced, right? A lot of times the law enforcement looked the other way on that. Um, but if you went in and you wanted to purchase, you couldn't purchase, um, you know, uh, birth control in a pharmacy, right? You'd have to get it uh, by another means. 
Um, and so the next step in the and here we have the phase three where there's a return to Sanger's original goal of um, seeing birth control as uh, as not a, uh, a a way of giving doctors the right to prescribe things to their patients, but rather bring it back to the um, the original original goal of Sanger, which was the birth control gives freedom for women and families. And this is about personal privacy and personal liberty. And the 1960s was a fertile time. Ha, no pun intended. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Sorry. Um, for that kind of thinking to come to the forefront, because as we just got out of with thinking about political participation and the women's liberation movement and um, and the, the uh, other liberatory movements at that time, um, that the ground was set for a, um, a return to the notion of personal liberty. And um, Planned Parenthood uh, is at the forefront of shifting the terms of the debate back towards liberty, privacy, and autonomy for both men and women as it relates to reproductive freedoms. And uh, it's the landmark case that we'll look at that wherein um, the, the Supreme Court takes up these Connecticut laws uh, to see whether or not the prohibition against the dissemination and use of birth control violates the United States Constitution. So let's quickly take a look at Griswold versus Connecticut. And here are some pictures of Estelle Griswold. And also uh, in the far left hand, you can see the picture there that um, in 1965, uh, an individual it, protesting outside of the Planned Parenthood in uh, Connecticut that um, was the subject of this um, this this case and see it says the law is the law or is it morality is in danger if we let people have contraceptives and then you see Estelle and her partner up here here uh, so this case is a, a challenge to the Connecticut uh, little Comstock act that was established in 1879 that prohibits the use of contraceptives even by um, and the distribution of contraceptives uh, so you can't distribute a con contraceptives you can't give people information about contraceptives and if you get the contraceptives even if you're married you can't use them in, uh, in the privacy of your own home so Estelle Griswold she's the director of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut she opens a birth control control clinic. The reason she opens that um, birth control clinic is to directly challenge those laws and in order to get arrested. Because to in in in, con, in constitutional law, there in, there needs to be a case, there needs to be a controversy. And so you can't hypothetically challenge the law. You have to set up a birth control clinic, you got to distribute the birth controls, and you got to get yourself arrested. And she was arrested for dispensing, dispensing contraceptives to a married couple. Um, and that and Griswold and her lawyers argue that that law violates um, a, uh, it, the individual's uh, right to uh, liberty, uh, in particular, the, the freedom of, of, of privacy that you have to make private decisions. Uh, Connecticut said that they were well within their right to have this law in the book because they said that uh, regulating health and morality is well within the regulatory powers of the state of Connecticut. Um, and they said that other states have these laws and, um, and that uh, so that if other states have these laws, like then they must be okay. And also that there are other types of birth control that you can use, like the rhythm method, right? And so that that was their argument in front of the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, Griswold, Estelle Griswold, uh, won the case. Um, the Supreme Court found that the, uh, the Connecticut law violates a woman's right to privacy. And so let's look at what that means and the implications for this case. So in the case Griswold versus Connecticut, the Supreme Court finds that the Connecticut law criminalizing the distribution and use of birth control is unconstitutional. And the reason they find it to be unconstitutional is because they say that it violates the right to privacy that is in the Constitution. Um, and so Griswold is important because it establishes that privacy is a constitutionally protected right. Um, and the right to privacy is basically the, the freedom that people have to make certain decisions about their bodies and their private lives without interference from the government. Um, and it's also important because in Griswold, the Supreme Court says that it is a 
fundamental right. Um, that it's not just a minor right, but that it we really can't live in a democratic society if we do not have this fundamental right to make choices about the, our private lives and our, our bodies. Uh, and so they, they place the right to privacy on par with practicing your religion, free exercise of religion, and um, you know, exercising your freedom uh, of speech. Um, privacy is as fundamental as, as those liberties. Now, the, the concerning aspect of the right to privacy is that it's not explicitly found in the Constitution. If you look at the right to speak freely, you need to look at the First Amendment, and it says, Congress shall make no laws abridging the freedom of speech, right? The word speech is right there. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That is not the case with the right to privacy. There's no amendment in the Bill of Rights that says that Congress shall not abridge your right to privacy. Um, rather, the right to privacy in Griswold was found in these things called the penumbras of the Bill of Rights. And so, you know, they basically say, if you take the First Amendment, the, the freedom to associate. And if you take the Third Amendment, the freedom that you have from government entering into your domicile to put soldiers in there. If you take the Fourth Amendment, the right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. If you take the Fifth Amendment, which basically says that you can't be forced to speak against yourself in a matter of a crime. And if you take the Ninth Amendment, that basically says just because the liberty isn't written down doesn't mean that that liberty doesn't exist for individuals. They basically say if you take those together, it forms this shadow, that's what a penumbra is, that gives us the right to privacy. But it's not explicitly in the Constitution. And that can be problematic. Um, right, you know, before I was uh, taping these lectures, um, you know, I'm watching the judicial nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Um, and there's a and there's concerns about well, whether or not she believes that there is in fact a constitutionally protected right to privacy in the Constitution. She's an originalist. She's a textualist to a certain degree. And if those words aren't in there, it may be interesting to see whether or not she actually thinks that people have the right to privacy. We will find out. Um, but because it's not explicit in, in the Constitution, that's where it becomes sort of problematic in terms of not so much contraceptives, but definitely when we get to abortion and we think about that. Um, and so Griswold is important too because it provides the framework for other cases dealing with privacy and in particular other cases dealing with reproduction. And so the big question we're going to be talking about in the next lecture is whether or not the right to privacy extends to the right to terminate your pregnancy. So where are we today with contemporary uh, contraceptive public policy? Um, and so you have the right to use contraceptives, thanks Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, but just because you have that right doesn't mean that you can actually exercise that right. And so today the main issues regarding contraceptives have to do with access and have to do with affordability. Um, now currently, the uh, probably the biggest public policy um, uh, that is in place that deals with contraceptive coverage is the Affordable Care Act of uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And it was passed in 2010. And it's actually in the next, uh, the upcoming or the current um, Supreme Court uh, session uh, that uh, the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act is actually going to be relitigated. And so keep your eyes on that policy may change um, you know, within the few uh, next uh, year or so. So keep your eyes on that. But what the Affordable Care Act does is that part of it says that any insurance company, the Affordable Care Act regulates insurance, private insurance. Um, and it says that any um, private insurer must uh, cover uh, a broad uh, uh, grouping of uh, contraceptives. And so the Department of Health and Human Services has identified 18 methods of contraceptives and it, the Affordable Care Act requires that private um, health insurance um, covers those 18 methods of contraceptives and it actually includes female sterilization as well, although it does not cover vaccine vasectomies, um, probably because vasectomies are more, um, happen more frequently than female uh, tubal ligation. Uh, they must cover the copayment uh, or uh, they must cover it without a copayment or co-insurance, uh, even if the deductible is not met. And we've seen that 
prior to the uh, Affordable Care Act that 20% um, of women were not covered. And today um, uh, only 4% are not covered. So it's done a good job in terms of um, uh, affordability. Uh, uh, access is, uh, a, a, is an issue as well um, in terms of religious exemptions and then also the effort to defund Planned Parenthood. And so um, there have been court cases that where um, corporations say that they're a religious corporation, not like a church, but Hobby Lobby is the case. Um, and we can talk more about that if you would like to drop me an email. I can go on and on, obviously. Uh, and so some corporations have basically said uh, we cannot uh, provide contraceptives through our insurance because of our religious beliefs. And the Supreme Court agreed with that, but basically said that uh, the corporation had to be owned by a small family um, that is clearly religious. And also they had a workaround so that the federal government provided the, the, the contraceptives, uh, uh, even though Hobby Lobby was exempted from it. And there's also been a move to um, defund um, Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood gets um, funding from state legislatures and state taxes. And at least 10 states to this point have reduced or eliminated their funding to Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood is one of the places where people go for a variety of reasons, but one to get um, prescribed and get um, uh, uh, access to birth control. Um, so that's where we are. And uh, you know that might be, if you're interested for your policy paper, either this one or the upcoming one uh, that we have two that we're doing, um, examining contraceptive policy might be an interesting um, a policy to examine. All right, thanks a lot. And um, next will be a lecture on abortion.